Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. So today, I'm joined by Mehdi Mostafa, other, also known as Mehdi Never Quits. And honestly, Mehdi Never Quits, that's a, that's a saying and phrase and name that really motivates me because I'm kind of the same way. I don't like to quit. I just like to keep going, even though some people might look at me like, why are you still going? Why are you still doing this? And it's like, I don't really care what you're thinking. I know what I'm thinking, which is I don't want to quit. So I just, you know, I met him through my coaching platform that I'm in. I invested in coaching because I want to learn how to help men quit porn. But Medi's also in this group and he reached out and I thought, why not have a conversation? So thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thank you, Harley. You know, just to introduce a little bit more about myself, similar to Harley, we're both the YouTube content creators, so it's pretty cool to see all the similarities. We're both in self-improvement, and we're also both aspiring coaches. We're trying to learn more about the coaching business while also trying to succeed in different areas, and very sim similar to what you just said, Harley, at the end of the day, you live in a world where people are going to look at you and be like, why do you keep going if you haven't gotten a result in 40, 60 days? But you know, as you get more into self-improvement, as you get more into this journey, you realize the times in the past five Irregardless of whether you go to the gym or not, irregardless if you're gonna make a YouTube video or not, like one day through God's grace you're gonna be 30, and you could either look back and be like, "I did the hard work," or "I didn't." And I think as you get older, you realize that your time is an investment, and it's really important to try to be productive to the best of your ability. So, yeah, I think we're two very like-minded individuals, and I'm very excited this is happening. So, heck yeah, man. Yeah, I like that. So I guess why did you? Well, first off, tell me about like why you started this YouTube channel, and then I guess branch into why you thought coaching might be a good idea, and also explain maybe your job that you do also. You're kind of like me, you got multiple things that you're in, and yeah. you're, you're, it might take a minute, which I'm totally down for, because it takes me a minute to explain what I do. So yeah, I'm just curious how you got started into each one of those. Of course, it's such a great question, and it's a little bit of a funny journey. So with YouTube, I actually started at the end of 2019. So to give some context, um, that was my sophomore year of college. So I just graduated last year. I'm still a little bit young, but I remember I had a YouTuber friend, and he was someone who vlogged, and literally he would have his phone right here, like vlog these videos with his camera, and I was just like, whoa, that's pretty cool. I've never seen someone do it right in front of my face. Like you see PewDiePie, you see all these content creators, but they seem like such an abstract with their hundreds of millions of subscribers, and then you're actually seeing someone in front of your face do it. So I think the idea was first implemented in my brain when I first saw him do it. But as I got to sophomore year, that was when the idea really started picking up. And I was like, wait, I really like this. I think it'd be cool to vlog. It'd be cool to record my experiences. Because I was someone who was very antisocial a couple of years ago. And I'm someone who relatively learned how to have, make eye contact, talk to other people, etc. So And it really benefited me in college. So if I could be social in college, I'm sure I could be social with this device here too. And obviously, it was a journey of uh, really getting over my, like, self-consciousness, like, you know, because when you first talk in a video, you're like, oh, my God, my voice, my eyes, <laughs> like, like <laughs> I'm recording the video myself and I'm posting it on the internet, what is it? But, you know, we first did it, and I actually, I'm going to be very honest here, when I first did YouTube, I actually did it for mostly the wrong reasons. I just did it because I obviously wanted clout and I just wanted popularity and I just wanted to blow up, and most of my videos constituted college vlogs and, like, all that, which was nice, but... I think when you do things for the wrong reasons, especially in hindsight, you get burnt out very fast. So even back then, I was only posting videos once a week compared to now where I post almost every single day. But I was getting burnt out so much so because my goal wasn't to make like quality content. My goal was like, hey, what's a video that's going to blow up? And then I'm going to get validation from these people and then etc. But I say this just because I actually had a year and a half hiatus in YouTube where during COVID back in 2020, I became a little bit depressed and obviously staying indoors for so long and kind of with like the shift in life dynamics and gaining weight. I eventually just burnt out from YouTube and I actually quit it for a year and a half. And how I got back into YouTube is interesting because when I first quit YouTube, there was never any plan to get back onto it at all. And I remember throughout 2021, I was kind of going through life, kind of going through emotions, but things were progressively getting worse for me in terms of my weight gain, kind of my mental health, etc. And I think... It was only when, at the end of 2021, 2022, like, when I when it got really bad for me and I saw that I gained, like, 30, 40 pounds. I had a semester left before I graduated with no employment opportunities, a gambling addiction, which I will talk about later, and just kind of really being in a bad rut. And my goal at that point was, like, look, I need to fix my life. I need to get my body back in shape because this is not who I want to be. This is not how I want to end college. And as I started losing weight, 
I started seeing my flesh change. And it was like, if I could see my arms right here and they could change, what other aspects of my life could change too? And that's when YouTube came back into the picture. And this time when I came back into YouTube, I actually had this message of like, look, I want to inspire people. I want to help people. And I actually want to give valuable content where it's not just to entertain for five minutes. It's like, ha ha ha, I'll swipe up. But more like, wow, I actually learned something that could change my life today. Because that's what I needed back then. So long story short, you know, I restored my fitness of sorts and I got YouTube along the way, which again was not expected, but very blessed. And, you know, we were able to go to China to over just 1K subs about a month ago recently. It's almost at 1100, which I know in the grand scheme of things isn't that much, but I'm very, I, it's a number I would have never thought possible at the start of last year. So very happy about it. And the reason why YouTube is so important for me is because it's a catalyst for other things. So as for coaching, um, I'm sure you can relate, but as part of being an inspired entrepreneur, you have to test so many different things and you have to fail a lot. And the funny thing with Leah is we actually both entered the same space two years ago. So she was actually a student just like me for another coach named Richard. I'm not sure if you know Richard, but Richard was a coach who uh, launched this high performance coaching program that would teach you how to make your own coaching program, et cetera. And again, I was really interested in it. I was like, look, I come from like a low income background. No one really taught me about entrepreneurship. This seems like a cool program. Like, why not? But similar to with YouTube, I kind of did it for wrong reasons where the goal was just like, oh my God, how can I make, how can I reach my 10K a month super quickly? So although it was a great experiment, I quickly crashed and burned with that too, kind of gave it up. And then it was only a year and a half later, AK around December, 2022, I reconnected with Leah. And I saw as a former student as well to see her level of success. I was like, okay, it seems that if I invest in her, it's going to be a lot more interpersonal this time. She comes from my background. So it's a lot more relatable. It's kind of like being a YouTuber and asking PewDiePie, how can I get 100 million subs versus you working with someone who has 10K subs? It's a lot more relatable. For sure. It's a lot more relative. So, you know, I got with her at the end of 2022. I came last year. I've been working with her for a few months. And also, just to be really honest with you, I, I don't have any regrets working with her. I've learned a lot. But I've also just figured that coaching as you said similar to last week in our call it's just not my main purpose at the moment and i think i'm glad that i had to go through two separate experiences and at least i can look forward and say look i gave it a try i didn't have it i know this is for me this is not for me and there's no regrets youtube is my main source that's where my passion my creativity my happiness comes from recording videos is like recording like it's like brushing my teeth for me at this nice. point there's no resistance to it it's genuinely something I want to do, and it takes a long time to do that, just like with the gym, just like with other endeavors, but I'm very happy to be in that place. And as you said, my job as well. So I'm a development associate currently for a nonprofit. I've been working here almost eight, nine months. Kind of crazy how fast time flies. And you do what I have a bit of a funny... I'm a development associate, so it's an entry-level position, and just it's just a bunch of different office tasks that we work on Salesforce sometimes, send emails to donors, just... A bunch of um different tasks but it's kind of funny and the reason why i say it's funny is because this job is actually located in dc even though i live in new york so it's been a bit of a funny situation i've been in uh the last eight months where i travel to dc either every week or every other week and i stay there for a day to go into the office do what i gotta do and then i work remotely for the rest of my time so people have looked at me and just like what they said with you about hey why do you never quit they're like why are you doing this job? How are you even maintaining the setup? But, you know, if there's a will, there's a way. And I'm honestly very happy with where I'm at right now. I'm very blessed. And I think a younger version of myself who was overweight, very depressed, very miserable at the start of last year is honestly beaming at where I'm at right now. And I, I, lo I look forward to keep leveraging that. So that's a little bit about me. Dang, that's amazing, sure. man. Yeah, like I see the – like there's two – sides to the coin where it's like you should focus on one thing only and you'll see that one thing grow but there's also the other side right. where it's like i'm kind of young i don't know exactly what my passion fully is i don't know where i should allocate my time i might as well say yes to a few different things so that i know exactly. whether i really like it or really don't it's better than going and being 40 and being like man i wish i would have tried whereas then now you can say oh i've tried it i didn't like it for x y and z but I'm so glad I yeah. tried it. The money was spent. The lessons were learned. And yeah, I love that. And, you know, I think with time, both of us, maybe like once we figure out our crafts more and understand what our true passions are, we'll be able to say no to more things 
more regularly. Exactly. But I guess sometimes a young entrepreneur has to say yes at times just for the learning experience alone. So yeah, that's really, I can relate a lot on some of that. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'd love to hear more about your story, honestly. I'm, I'm interested in that. Sure. Like, I joined, well, you know, I, I, I'm I, debating where to start, I guess. Like, a year and a half ago, my first episode on this podcast was honestly just a journal about porn. <laughs> my problems with it, how it was gripping me. And it, it was actually the, one of the reasons how I've been able to pretty much quit throughout these years. It's like... I just have had that accountability system with the world. It's like whenever I'm feeling the urge, Harley's making a video. You know, even if no one watches, I don't really care. But, you know, people watch. But I do that. I I go to school for industrial engineering, which is kind of like the engineering of systems within businesses, how to make a, a business efficient and profitable using financial analysis statistics. And so it's like that's kind of cool. And I was a mechanical engineering student, but it didn't even resonate with me at all. I'm realizing like I'm such an entrepreneurial business minded guy and I found this major, honestly, thanks to God in some ways. I don't know how I found it. It's just lucky. And, you know, I have a few other YouTube channels. I'm a huge fan of YouTube and Facebook automation because I feel like having a, something, it's like digital real estate. So I, I do that. And finally exactly. I've thought like, why not try a coaching program one-on-one -on -one deep dive with people who are truly interested in quitting porn because it'll keep me off of the porn addiction because i still have it every day i'm like whew. you know it sounds crazy because some people it never was a problem for them but for me it was a big one so yeah that's kind of where you found me you know lee is kind of all in on coaching and i try to have to say to her like it's about one fourth of my goal right now leah and i know like you might right. say if i would have pushed all my time into coaching I might make a lot more money, but it's like I have to go at my pace and I I can't I exactly. can't force something, yeah. especially when I have other things that I'm really passionate about too. So yeah, that's kind of my in a nutshell current scenario. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm really yeah, I definitely agree with that, especially with coaching. Like at the end of the day, I think one of the beautiful things I've learned with both Lee and like my previous experience is that at the end of the day, as you indulge like not indulge, but like as you go in different platforms and you try to test what works and what doesn't work. You really can't force it. I think when something comes to you genuinely and you find purpose in that, that's when the results come. But then if you're chasing something, you're always like, I just have to fit this square into a circle. I've often, like for some people it works. Like some people are like, hey, I have to make 10K in 30 days. I can do it. For me personally, if, I, if that ever becomes my main goal or I pedestalize that goal, it, I the results I obtain from those 30 days will be far from actually even achieving it because it just kind of corrupts the purpose. It kind of corrupts the why. And... I find that's not talked about as much, which is a little bit disappointing because I'm sure that is the other side of the coin that other people are not mentioning to you when they mention, oh yeah, there is someone who made 10K in 30 days, which I'm sure is possible, but that's not everyone's necessarily primary goal or that's not necessarily the way people are going to want to do it in 30 days and that's it is what comes as quickly might come just as fast, etc. So, sure. well you know, I really, I, I think that's why I resonated with you the most, like just how you just spoke your mind in that coaching session. I was like, wow, this guy's really honest. He's just staying in it. Like Leo's giving this pitch saying, Hey, um, go on in coaching. You should really, and, and then you're just saying like, yeah, but I got this, I have this. And I can really resonate with somebody who's just speaking their mind like that. And also just being honest with themselves rather than like trying to hide themselves in the box just to fit the room. I'd say for sure, man. Yeah. Like I was really annoyed that day kind of just because, you know, I was, I don't know how like it was just you know of course i joined this a month ago so it's still new but like i'm finding out that well she's not she's never caught coach coach someone in this specific niche really and this niche is slightly more sensitive and it's not something that you can just shove down people's throats and i was doing the leah strat which is a great strat in my opinion which is you know dm search out five calls every day and it's kind of like I found out in this niche, you almost have to let people come to you, especially with this combo. You can't like exactly. force them into the corner. It's like, Hey, you want to talk about porn? And then they're like, I don't know if I've ever told anyone <laughs> about porn before. And then it's like, okay, now exactly. that we're on the call, here's the offer. And it's like, I don't like that strat. I'd rather people yeah. get to know me over time through my podcast. And honestly, if they truly want, and through my content, and if they really want to have a combo, then I'll have the combo. But like, that's, I've just, I'm tailoring and making switches to it. Like, like I'm kind of making the executive decision. She has her framework, but it's like, 
I have to disagree. I can't just agree and say, yeah, you're right. I should just follow the framework and, you know, but to be nuanced, she's taught me a lot already about sales and about this whole process. So thanks to her, I'm, you know, able to make these decisions. And so, yeah, I'm a huge fan of kind of speaking my mind in not any, like an asshole way. Like I tried not to be like an ass to her on the phone. Like I was just speaking up about my, my questions and my thoughts in as humble way as possible. Cause like, in my opinion, humility is kind of one of the biggest traits that I strive to be or strive to have. Absolutely. It's like, I'm not a huge fan of people, even if they're super successful and then they're incredibly cocky. It's like, uh, I just, I'm not, you're hiding something. Yeah. This isn't genuine. And I saw a video of yours that said like humility is like also one of your, in your opinion, best traits to have in regards to self-improvement. Cause when you're able to have that humility, cr criticisms can come in and you're able to take them and you're, you're not overlooking solutions that a, a arrogant person might think, Oh, I know better. So yeah, I, exactly. That's kind of some thoughts there. No, it's awesome, man. Yeah, I guess the only question I have, because especially you joined the program a little bit earlier, uh, just how did you find me? I'm just kind of, because obviously with Leah, I have a little bit more of an interesting story with her, and it goes a little bit more to just like the superficial, like, hey, I got to know her through Instagram, and I just saw her, and I was like, hey, she'd be a great coach. So I'm kind of curious, how did she pop up for you? Was it just, you saw her on Instagram one day, and you're just like, hey, I'm interested. Did she message you? Like, oh, let's kind see. of curious about that. I think it was like a year and a half ago, literally after I started my podcast, she got it. Like, I think. I might have found her or she found me. I don't know. And then we got into the DMs and she was saying like she was supporting the journey and I was supporting her journey. And then a few months after that, I actually sat down and had a podcast with her, kind of picked her brain oh, wow. on the topic of coaching and on, you know, what she does, et cetera. And, you know, I only could get a small sliver of what I, she had to offer in some sense. But at that current moment, I felt as if my time management was pretty solid and I didn't, I didn't want to pay for that. But then I heard she was doing some, you know, she helped people become coaches. So I actually just DM'd her like two months ago or a month ago saying, I actually kind of want to help people quit porn. And so we got on a call and, and that's kind of how it continued. That's awesome. No, thank you for, for the backstory. And that's definitely cool. And I, yeah, I'm noticing with a lot of Leah's like clients and just in general, like, a lot of them didn't know her from before. And then they kind of just developed into more of that, like, uh, coaching relationship a little later. So that's, that's definitely cool, man. And again, I mean, Hey, if you didn't join, we wouldn't be here today. So for sure, man, you know, awesome. Glad to be here. Yeah. Like it's some people might look at this scenario and be like, Harley, you spent, a few thousand bucks on something that you weren't even certain about, or you don't really know about, or what are you doing? And I've done, I've just been rethinking this whole thing. And it's kind of like, well, the people that might be skeptical are people that don't really believe in themselves. It's kind of the people that believe in themselves So where it's like, well, I could either spend this money on, you know, food or rent, or I could spend this money on investing into myself, or I could spend it on a trip. But it's like, it just depends on what the value of the things you're buying are in your mind. In my mind, improvement and Im improving my skills are like highest value for me. So I just, I found it to be kind of a no brainer. It would also force me to act even if, you know, she might not be the most perfect coach for me. No one is going to be perfect, and putting down that cash forces me to move, and I'm a huge fan of that. So yeah, exactly. Uh, success loves action. That's like that's a phrase I believe. Success loves action. Yeah. Or no, no. Success loves speed. Mm. Yeah, that was the that was the uh, quote from the first coach, Richard. Because I remember he used to say that a lot. I was like, yeah, speed is like action. So definitely for sure, man. And yeah, you're saying that. I've just, I've been skimming your vids because I find them to be pretty, you know, motivating. Sometimes you open up a video sure. and someone doesn't have that many subscribers like me or you, and then you hear them talk and then it's like, they aren't that interesting, but like, or they aren't that captivating. But I was like, I watched like three of your videos pretty much all the way through. Cause I was like, dang, I can resonate. This guy is speaking from the heart. He's explaining about his story of going through ruts and getting out of them. And you know, I could totally see how having a YouTube 
and being a person online who helps motivate people in this dimension is just a great motivator for yourself as well to never really fall into those same ruts as before. Like if you didn't have the thousand subscribers in the world watching you, what's holding you accountable to like not just eat crap again and fall back into the same trap. So yeah, man, it's cool. To Absolutely. See. It's a great point. And I also think people need to realize that when you do, accumulate those results over time, be with YouTube or with like your weight loss or anything. It's a result of the change you have to make internally. So sometimes people are like, oh, the value is because the thousand subscribers or the 10,000 subscribers. But my argument sometimes that those 10,000 subscribers are the progress you make every single day. It's a reflection of the changes you're making. So it's like not the, it's like this phrase. It's like the castle doesn't make the king. Rather, the king honors the castle with his presence. I think that's kind of like the mindset shift I've had to learn over the years where as I started with YouTube or like even coaching, I was like, oh my God, the money, the subscribers, the likes, these are the things I'm chasing, but that's not what makes the YouTuber. That's not what makes a great coach. By being a great coach, you have those things come along, but that should never be the main priority. Otherwise, you, you've you lost the re you lost the purpose of why you're doing this to begin with. And that's something I've had to learn a lot over the years. And I'm very grateful to kind of be on the sort of other side. I mean, you're never really truly on the other side, right? But, you know, just to have realized that over the years. Yeah, really well said. It's like, I'm curious what your, what's your overall mission with your YouTube? Is it internal or is it external? Meaning like, is it for your self improvement or is it for the world and for others? Or is it kind of for both? I'm just kind of curious what your, yeah. Yeah. So I think one thing I love about YouTube, and this is something I'm not sure if you'll agree or disagree with this, but with self improvement YouTubers, I've noticed two things that really jumpstart their journey, not just coaching or whatever endeavor they do. But I've noticed that one, usually their lives get a lot better when they're fitness. And I think YouTube is kind of like this sort of personal journey that it's like a sort of personal diary. Right? It's like what you, it's it's like what you said why you started this first episode. It's just a diary for yourself to mitigate this addiction you had, and it kind of just evolves to something more. And I think YouTube is a representation of that. Like YouTube can start becoming a business for you. It can start becoming a place where other people reach into you with their questions, and that's where those genuine coaching calls could happen. And I think it's such a versatile platform where. It's that project that really is your own. So like with your job, the thing about like working a nine to five is that you do work for the company you're at. That's great and all, but the moment you get your paycheck, that's really where your work ends versus with YouTube. It's like, it's just a project. You slowly keep snowballing more and more. And then other great avenues can come. Coaching can come from it. Um, other opportunities can come from it, but it's this one avenue where you keep changing over time. You're recording that change and you'll look back at it years and be like, wow, in 2019, I was like this, but in 2020, I was like this. And they accumulated into something that's now completely different. So I think with YouTube, the reason why I'm so passionate about it, especially as someone who did quit, kind of thought that quitting would help me and then found out that quitting does not really help you at all. And it's actually, I'm actually so glad you mentioned this earlier in your video because you mentioned people are like, oh, why don't you quit? Why don't, why do you give up? But a lot of people think by giving up, they relieve themselves of the stress of performance and you actually do not, which is something we could talk about a little bit later, but you know, I think it's just one of those projects that, hey, if I'm working on this every single day, it's truly my own. It's something I can call my own. And it might not be tomorrow. It might not be next week. It might not be next month. It might not be even next year. But eventually, all those videos will pay off. And it's something that I can look back at and be like, that was a journey. Um, and you get, you just cannot say the same thing with a job. You just cannot say the same thing with other things. Because at the end of the day, it's not really your own in a sense. Your work ends the moment you get your paycheck. And... It's just not, it doesn't have that interpersonal bond, I'd say. So that's, I, I really love YouTube because of what it represents, what it brings about. And I think it both is an internal and external thing for sure. And I'm sure, I'd love to know more about your YouTube journey. Did coaching come first? Did YouTube come first? Is YouTube also this sort of avenue where you're kind of leveraging these other platforms? Like what, what does it mean for you? Yeah, it's a great point. Like what you're saying about how, like you're documenting the process. It's not like, you know, you sometimes see people that, and you're like, man, how did they get there? But like you slide to their late old, earliest videos and you're kind of like, whoa, they, their first video was worse than mine. Or, you know, like exactly. you can go to the, you know, as a podcaster, I could go to the Joe Rogan first pod and it's like horrible production quality. And not that mine was amazing, but it's like you see what just consistency and, you know, recording the process does. And it's like you just get better and better each time. Like, you know, it quitting is just well it's i kind of have an interesting like i grew up in a pretty small community so like everyone kind of knows in this community that harley's doing this and like for the first little bit they were like oh this is kind of interesting but then you know the viewage dropped and then like 
like I saw like some of my friends were like, well, you're not getting many views. Why do you keep going? And then I'm like, well, I just have to keep going. Otherwise I'm going to regret my whole life. But I guess, how did it start? Absolutely. Like the coaching idea has only been like a month long idea. So this is the YouTube has been a lot longer than my coaching idea for sure. But I've, you know, I, I used to be, yeah, just to give even more context, like four years ago, I was huge into like music production. So I created a YouTube and a, and a SoundCloud for music, making beats. Then I moved on to like Rocket League streaming. It's like a video game. And, you know, I had a YouTube yeah, for that. Well, and then I slid into the next adventure was the podcast. But like for this, for some reason, this one stuck. And it's like, okay, this one's stuck and I'm just going to keep going. So, yeah, like... I'm not sure what, what is it for me? It's a, I remember just like a few days ago, I was actually really debating quitting, which is so interesting because it was like, I was feeling like, Oh, I just, it's kind of expensive. I pay an editor to do some work. I just paid for this coaching. I was kind of strapped financially for a little bit. It was stressing me out. And then I was debating, Oh, should I quit this podcast? Should I pause it? And then I've just been, I've been rethinking over and over and it's like, man, you're going to look back at this pause and be so regretful. And it's like, do not pause. You've got to keep going. And my roommate, I kind of, he started a podcast too. And he's actually decided to take a pause like last week. And he's getting me thinking. And luckily I have a very supportive girlfriend and a very supportive family. That's kind of like, you wanted to start this. Look at how passionate you've been about this. Do not quit. And honestly, I can't stress how amazing my support network really is. And incredible so yeah like what it is for me is kind of just i don't know there's an interesting hormozy quote where it's like you don't have to deserve success but if you do the things that get success why not get success it's kind of like you know youtube shorts i see that as like such an untapped potential where it's like if i just do x one short a day that's where the growth is coming for my channel and it's like you know i do the math and it's like if i just keep doing this thing you know, one of these is bound to pop off. If I keep doing these Instagram reels exactly. over and over and over again, it's like, you know, probability is going to be in, in my favor. You know, they're going to see this guy with long hair and, you know, who's kind of like, yeah. you know, open-minded and, you know, you're just going to see my face over and over. If, especially if I keep going, Oh, I have a thousand videos. Perfect. I only, you know, it's like, ah, what it is for me is just maybe myself, like validating that I, you know, I, I don't know if I have something to prove to the world, but I almost have something just to prove to myself. Like I'm a person who strives exactly. more and I'm a person that I want to be different and I, I want to be financially free and I want to, I want to be a leader, like just a lot of those things. So. No, that's awesome, man. Like, I think we share a lot of values and funny enough, I know we've all talked about this point of quitting. So I actually want to give the perspective of someone who did end up quitting YouTube for a year and a half. And uh, like my perspective of quitting has evolved so much. And I think a lot of people, what they don't understand, and this is something that I've been taught so much since I was a kid, is that whenever you're stressed, whenever you're strapped, whenever you're in a difficult situation, you should do less. This is the advice you typically hear from so many people. But as I found out the hard way in two separate situations, th these were both in college, right? You actually do not improve your life when you do less things. And I'm actually going to tell you the psychology of why this is. So... I remember in um, in my first two years of college, I was pre med. I'm not pre -med, I'm not medicine, but that was kind of an endeavor I wanted. And I remember I took 18 credits both semesters. And people that you were like, "Yo, you're taking 18 credits. You're so crazy. You're so insane." And there is some truth to it. It is insane as a freshman to just go into it, and be like, "I'm gonna take four STEM classes, one language class," and boom. And I definitely had the repercussions of that. But I remember in sophomore year, I was like, "Okay, let me take 12 credits." And interestingly enough, Harley. Mm. I was still stressed almost the exact same way as when I took 18 credits. And I remember yeah. I noticed that back then. I was like, wait, I thought if I do less, my stress levels should go down. But it's pretty much I did less. I'm still kind of strapped for time. I'm still kind of stressed over these classes. Interesting. And then things, I didn't do a deep dive on it because it wasn't necessary. But then fast forward two and years later, where again, I gained the weight over time. My depression got really bad. Um, I was ruminating over the past. And literally, it was just really bad for me. As I started picking up more things in my last semester of last year, like I started losing weight. I was like, wait, if I'm losing weight and I'm changing my body, I can also change the way I approach YouTube. Let me pick up YouTube. When I picked up YouTube, that was when my social energy started coming back. And I was like, wait, 
I can be socially charismatic again. I can still end the semester meeting great new people. So I started picking that up. And then I started getting invited to more events and more events. And despite picking up with more and more things, it seemed that the quality of my life actually got better instead of worse. And as I learned from both just my own experience and with talking to other people, it's that if you truly want to get out of a rut in life, you need to do more of the things that are under your control. That's why they say, don't ever give up the gym. Don't ever give up a sport that you like doing because these are things you have a large say in how they go. The What you put in is what you'll get out. So the more you engage in something that truly brings you joy, truly brings you happiness, the more you'll feel in control over your life, even if like your job is spiraling out of control, even if like other things are going outside of control. But the moment you're like, hmm, seems like work is stressful. Let me just give up the gym to make up for another two hours of Excel sheets. <laughs> your life is going to get worse. It doesn't get better. And I, I find it so sad because... This advice is so spoon-fed to the point you get indoctrinated and then people are like, wait, I, I, I follow what society told me. I, I, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing that. But my quality of life is dramatically lower. And the answer is not doing less. It's actually by doing more. But it's doing more of what you actually love and bring you joy because that is what's going to give you control in your life and make you realize, wait, I can do this. I can do that. So even if work is stressful, I still recorded my YouTube video today. I still got on a podcast with Harley today. I still went to the gym. But this is a lesson that I learned too late. And I'm saying this as a 23-year-old. And there's some people who never learned this lesson. So I think that's why this idea of quitting is so fascinating. Because when you understand that perspective and you also think it's a perspective that, hey. Because people, another complaint I've seen people say, and not to go on a rant for this for too long, but people are like, oh my god, becoming a doctor, it takes 12 years. Becoming a lawyer, it takes 12 years. Becoming a successful YouTuber, it takes 5 years. But those years are going to pass by anyways. So when you combine the two together... It's just a very illogical decision to quit. It's actually, you are destroying any reward you could potentially get by quitting. So it becomes a very illogical decision. I think once you learn to develop that perspective, it's like, you're, it's not even like, oh my God, I have to force myself not to quit. It's more like, it's just very disincentivizing to quit. And this is something I think if I had learned three, four years ago, it just, I mean, I'm very grateful I learned it now, better late than ever, but. I just wish people had this perspective. I think too many people approach th these things the wrong way. They want apps in 30 days. They want most of the in 30 days. And that's really not the way you should be approaching it. But and I'm sure you can relate to some ideas I said. But yeah. yeah, that's really well said. Like I I have an episode called Do Hard Things to Decrease Your Stress Level. And it's kind of like you said, it's kind of like a paradox. It's like or do more things or it's like I remember the days what, during COVID or I saw some people who – you know, they had a few online classes, but they didn't have a job and they didn't hit the gym. And then I would always hear them say like, oh, yeah, I'm so stressed for time. Whereas I'd my work still was essential. I I cleaned, you know, the cleaning business. I was out there cleaning and then I was doing school and then I was, I guess, and hitting the gym, you know, keeping busy. And I was I found out that, like, the more I can stack in the honestly, the more productive I can be. Because it's like, if you wake up and you're like, oh, I only have one assignment today. I can take it easy. And then you kind of like, you know, you sit on YouTube, you sit on whatever, you play a Rocket League match. And then all of a sudden, you've just wasted six hours of your day. And then you feel that, oh, I don't have very much time. Whereas if you're forced exactly. to like, well, I have this, this, and this today. So I better get moving now. And then you realize like, huh, the more I can pack in, the more adventurous life is, and actually the less stressed out I am because I just become way more productive. Oh no, a hard task comes up. Oh, bring it on. I'm ready for hard tasks. That's what I, that's my life is built around. And you know, that I totally, I get that part. And you also mentioned something about like your social skills started to increase the more you continue down this journey. And I feel like that's true. It's like, you know, talking to a camera for like, hours and hours and hours and hours it's like that builds you into someone who can speak at least somewhat well and especially if you do it over x period of time i found the same thing especially interviewing people it's like you get to i'm trying to learn how to be a great listener great talker you know ask the right questions and you made another amazing point of like the years will pass by anyways it's like oh you could take the route of quitting and not taking or or the idea of, oh, I have a dream, but I never took it. But it's like, what what else are you going to be doing? You're going to be watching Netflix and you're going to be wasting your exactly. life and scrolling on the gram. Like that. Why not? 
like squeeze in something that you're truly passionate about and see growing with time because you know you're gonna have to sacrifice and squeeze out some of the scrolling in Netflix but it's like might as well slice off some of that than to just oh I'm not gonna take in this self-improvement pill of whatever this is YouTube or whatever <laughs> yeah oh I'll just keep the you know oh I don't want to take on this thing because it's oh it's gonna take away from my precious relaxation time and it's like well according to a lot of time mastery and performance people you have a lot more time than you think and so yeah it's yeah. let's well just keep moving so yeah exactly and, and you know you find this i think i'm sure you can relate to as someone who played video games before and like i'm I'm, not, I'm a former video gamer myself too i like don't get me wrong when spider-man 2 ps5 drops three months from now, i'm gonna play it still but in general video games are something that I've largely given up. Even TV shows I don't watch. Mm -hmm. And you just think, especially with hindsight, these are not even really relaxing things. Like, you look at the times like, wow, where did the hour go? Where did my two hours go? And then you'll start stressing about it. Then you'll be like, wait, as soon as this TV show ends, I have to go to work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then it's just it's just negative forms of escapism. So even what's relaxing is not really relaxing. I actually find doing YouTube videos hardly, like especially in the uh, point of where I'm at now in life, that's relaxing sure. to me. Recording this video and be like, look, I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to share my thoughts with the world. That's relaxing to me. Trying to come up with a title, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And I generally, I think I think what people have lost, and this is something I got lost in myself in the type of society we live in, we're so used to chasing pleasure that we forgot what fulfillment means. And I'll tell you an example of fulfillment. Like a couple of years ago, I was someone in high school. I was the typical skinny, nerdy kid, not really athletic whatsoever. And I remember in my senior year, I had to train to run a 5K. And there was this kid named Jake. He was three inches taller than me. This guy's like six foot three. He was a basketball star athlete and he was in my class. And if you think about it, you're like, dude, there's no way I'm going to beat him. But it was just something where I remember we first ran our first three miles and I was like, okay, I have some work to do. And then over the weeks, I put more work in. I do more trials. I do, I just, I'd be like, okay, is it, should I eat before the race? Should I eat after? And try to figure out what works and what doesn't work. And I slowly increased my mind, uh, my time, and I slowly increased my lung capacity, and slowly increased my mental willpower to run the last two minutes, even when every muscle in your body does not want to run. Sure. And eventually, the day of the race, you know, like even with the probability stacked against me, I beat him by ten seconds, which in running is quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And the point is not to brag, but the point is, hardly even five, six years later from that, I'm no longer a runner. But that is one of the most proud moments I've ever had in my life, and that's a moment I can look back and be like. I can cherish this because that work led to something fulfilling, led to something that I can say I beat the odds versus as something you said, like with porn or like even another instant gratification moment, you're not going to look back at it and be like, yeah, I'm so proud I watched that. I'm so proud I relieved myself for two and a half seconds. No, you're going to like look into it with shame. And funny enough, even if you didn't, let's just say you enjoyed it and you didn't even have any shame with it. You're not going to even remember what you watched two days later. Like if someone asked you two days later, like, hey, remember what video you watched last night? You'd be like, what? What, what, what did I watch? Versus with a moment where you're fulfilling and you're genuinely pushing, it might seem hard at the moment, but you remember that forever. Like, that's a story I can tell my grandchildren 50 years from now with, you know, I hope so. But that the point being is that as a society, we've largely lost what it means to be fulfilled. And part of fulfillment is inevitably hard work versus with pleasure. We're so obsessed, so like obsessive with, with chasing pleasure, but... It's so fleeting, and you really just don't even remember it. What really comes easy, really, it just you'll be like, "What did I do two days ago? What TV show? What episode did I watch a week ago?" You won't even remember what you spent two hours mindlessly frockling about, which is truly the sad part. So when people say it's relaxing, I I really question what's the actual relaxation. It's going to a sauna, and people are like, "Wait, this is a hot room," but you're actually healing your body. You're actually taking time to meditate. That's what's actually relaxing, and you come out of it with some benefits. Sure. So I think it's also re-challenging what actually brings value to our lives. But totally, man. Yeah, it's really well said. I love that. Like, I made another video that was something like, "Your life is a story. Make it the most captivating story ever." Because you know, so many people are exactly. watching other people's lives, whether that be on Netflix, YouTube, social media, and you know, they're. They might not be even that proud about their life. And like you're saying, you, they might be stressed out that they're wasting their life or spending so much time and they're really not improving. And it's like, why not go out there and start living a life that other people would want to watch or a life that you f are so captivated by that you're able to tell the world about. And that's kind of the life that I've started to create. And it's been truly a, a fun thing to do. And even though, 
oh, I don't always feel like getting on the mic and I don't always feel like, you know, editing videos and I don't always feel like reaching out to new people and I don't, I don't really care because it's like, these are the things that, like you said, I can look back on and either A, tell my kids about, t tell myself or just, it's something that I did that, you know, separated me from others. It made me unique. It pushed me to the next level. A lot of people stay at the same level. Oh, once I finish college, my education ends. I can just work my job, come home, watch football. It's like, now you're just going to stay at level like five your whole life. I want to hit level exactly. 150. Or you know what I mean? Just I want to keep leveling exactly. up each day, week, whatever. And that's why I totally feel you. It's like doing something that you don't always feel like doing, but you know, looking back, you're going to be proud and that you're going to be able to be glad that you did it. And I'm totally with you, man. It's our culture. Like, Oh, comfort in. There's just so much like comfort foods. Just, Oh, just be comfortable. You know, stay the way you are. You're perfect the way you are. Oh, and I just, I don't really like that message because no one's perfect the way they are. And the more you keep pushing to be better, you know, the closer to perfection you might be, but you'll never be perfect. But I don't know. It's just comfort is the wrong goal. Discomfort, like you're saying, is sometimes the per the great goal. So Exactly. And, you know, I find, and again, I, I, I even have to call myself out because there's still times where I want to see comfort. But what I've noticed, and especially other self me YouTubers have said this, and this is going to be a bit of a strong word, but... Comfort's almost like a castration for what your soul is. It almost castrates like your soul's true yearning to do something meaningful and fulfilling in life. So that's why, you know, it's kind of funny because a couple of months ago I was in a working event and I remember talking about how I, over the years I've studied Arabic because this is a language that both my mom and my dad speak, but it's something that I unfortunately did not grow up with. And I was very resentful over the first couple of years that I didn't know how to speak. And I was always like, I'm going to die one day without knowing. I had a very victimhood mindset about it, which... You could arguably justify, okay, this is justified or not justified. But the point being is I eventually took action. I was like, look, this is not going to be the rest of my life. I want to learn to speak my tongue. I want to learn the, like, the syntax, the grammar, the diction, all that. And I'm, I have a brain. I have two hands. I can do it. And I remember recounting this story to my coworker. And my coworker is someone who is from Indian origins. And he just looked at me when I said it. And he's like, damn, I wish I learned Hindi. He literally, he sees someone who's a couple of years older than me. And I can just tell the look in his face, there was a mix of like resentment or like also just regret and saying, I never learned. And it was a reminder to me because I could have easily made a decision back when I was 18. Hey, I'll just keep being in this mentality. I'm never going to learn my language. I'm going to just keep blaming them, blame my parents, blame the world, blame my friends, blame my family, blame everyone but myself. And I think, you know, the thing about blaming yourself is that a lot of people do not want to do that because they think it's the worst thing in the world to be like, wait. It is really my fault that I'm in the situation. It's really my fault that I quit YouTube. It's really my fault that I let myself go. But when it's your fault, it also means you can change things. It doesn't mean that it's outside of your control. It doesn't mean that, wait, if it's my dad's fault, that means he's the only one that can change it. If it's your fault, yeah, that might suck, but you're the one who can change the situation. You're the one that can learn the language. You're the one that can start YouTube and take it by its reins. But so many people have just become very negligent and not proactive to the point where even, even my coworker, he's still young. He's still only 30. He can learn his language right now. Like, is it going to be the easiest thing in the cake? No, but are, what's worse, the pain of regret on your deathbed saying, I never learned my mother language or the pain of like, yeah, I had to suffer and say that phrase 10,000 different times, but I eventually got it. And I just think that a lot of people, again, like we need to re-question what this idea of happiness comes from. Because even watching football, there, there's this argument that I'm not sure if you know Hamza, he's really mm. popular, but... He made this argument that, like, and again, it's a little bit extreme, but so be it. He's talking like the men who watch like sports and they they applaud the sports. They're arguably cowards because you watch this and you're like cheering somebody else who's winning, but why is it not you who's winning that soccer game? Why is it not you who's out on the field and playing football and winning that? You're cheering somebody else to live. You're cheering somebody else for them to live their dream life, which is beautiful. You should cheer them on, but you're putting all this time on the TV screen. Cheering somebody else on your their, on your behalf to win for you when it's not you putting yourself to win. And when you think of it that way, you can't really look back and see it the same way. And if you do go back and still have no qualms with it, you, you just don't want it, honestly. But yeah, that's my two cents on really that. Really well said. Like, makes me think of something like, 
I feel like there's also some people that might have a lower conscientiousness level or just might not have the same kind of strivings as others. I don't want to look down on people and say, oh, you're not as good because you don't start a YouTube or you're not as good because you don't you know, start a side hustle. And I'm like, that's not my goal. But I feel like there's, a, there's at least a percentage of people that know that deep down that they want that more, but they don't do it. And that's like I can totally r- relate to people because I remember like having ideas and not wanting to start – or like wanting to start but not you know taking the jump but yeah like i think i think you know in today's world it's pretty easy to be successful like there's a pretty low percentage of people that are out there grinding every day on the youtube out there grinding on the social media and trying their best it actually is kind of good news for us because there's lower competition so that means you can stand out a little bit easier if everyone was doing youtube it'd be a lot harder so I don't actually mind if some people want to just spend their lives watching other people's lives. That's fine by me. And you bring up a really good point of like resentment and how like you are the person in control. If you start to be resentful about someone else, you no longer have any control of your life. And I kind of want to bring up a story, which, you know, it's a biblical story. I grew up in a religious household. You know, I don't, I'm not Christianity. I find to be very useful. So I use the stories and apply them. Cain and Abel, interesting story. Like Cain was a person who was putting up sacrifices that were not pleasing to God, whatever that might mean. Maybe he didn't try his hardest. Whatever the sacrifice was, wasn't that high quality. His brother Abel gave great sacrifices. He tried his best and he was rewarded by being supported by the community. Everyone around him loved him. People didn't really like Cain. Soon enough, Cain goes to God and says, God... Why are you blessing Abel over there, but not me? This is not fair. And God's like, well, it's all your fault because you haven't put, been putting up the right sacrifices. And like, that's kind of something that really just hits me hard because it's like, Harley, what sacrifices are you going to give to God, the world, etc., to yourself? What sacrifices are you going to make in life? Are you going to go the easy path or are you going to go the extra mile that of course is very hard and might be insanely stressful but it's going to be worth it in the long run and it might make the world a better place like i see it as like an interesting way to i don't know it's i don't know if you fully get where i'm going but it's like i don't ever want to be in the position where i'm starting to blame others for my scenario i want to always be in control and i want to be held 100 percent responsible for my sacrifices that i've made on the earth and you know, I want my sacrifices to be high quality. I want my efforts to be 110% because I honestly couldn't live with myself if I was if I was working at 20, 30% capacity. It just, I would hate myself and I would blame others probably for it. Yeah, man. And, you know, I find that like usually when you blame other people or you usually blame everything and everyone but yourself, you, you, on average, most of these people, usually their quality of life or their happiness or like their overall mood, it's it's significantly lower. And again, society has thought in such a way where you would think it's the opposite. The person who blames, the person who doesn't take any responsibility, they're free. They're, they're, they're not taking it. They're not feeling stressed from their decisions. But these are the people who ironically feel are the most miser- miserable ones. They're the ones who are often the most petty. They're the ones who are often complaining about everything and everything all the time. And yeah, it's those who seem to ironically take the most responsibility. Logic would have it that, oh, these are the people that should be the most stressed, they should be the most miserable, but these are some of the kindest, most lighthearted people who are generous. These are the people who are doing great things. They have a smile on their face. Even if 101 things went wrong in the day, they can still end the day being like, I'm genuinely grateful. And I think when, if somebody, and I think anyone can do this, if they take a step back and genuinely observe both human nature and kind of observe wait what have i been taught versus what i'm actually seeing i think anyone will start realizing these truths or as you kind of brought up those the abel and cain these sort of like uh, parables it could be from christianity it could be from another religion but you notice just these themes come up again and again and it's just i think it living in a world where everything's looking for safe uh, for face value if you can look beyond that you'll find different nuances that could really change your life again like it's like again you're taught if you do less, you're stressed less. But as I've experienced, as other people have shown, 
you're actually more stressed. Or even people like I'm gonna be honest with you. I come from a background that was a little bit poor socioeconomic, and we're often taught that hey, uh, rich people are evil. Or like oh hey, rich people have it all. But ironically, when I'm talking to the cashier a couple of weeks ago, who said hey, I'm coming from upstate New York. I grew up with rich friends, but all these friends are 300 like 300 pounds. They're overweight. They're complaining all day. They live very sedentary lifestyles. Again, not everything's for face value. Some of the people who are given everything, ironically, have no purpose at all because what is there to strive for? So you got to just, people have to really develop this intuition that I think is innate, but a lot of people are not tapped into it because they're scared to tap into it because of that kind of castration effect that, hey, why worry about this? Just play the TV mindlessly. You deserve it. Or, hey, why put in five hours of drill practice when you can just watch Messi score the goal on your behalf? Like, it's just, again, if that's what you truly want, who am I to say anything else? But a lot of people, I feel like, deeply don't want it, but also deeply don't want to admit it to themselves because the first way to solve a problem is admitting you have one, which is the hardest step, arguably. Man, yeah, really well said. It's, huh, yeah, you said a lot of good things about, like, it seems like maybe it's, maybe you are right and every single person does really want that more, but they lie to themselves and they just kind of fall for this easy pill that the government kind of seems to push or that culture seems to push. Ooh, eat the easy fast food, easy Netflix, exactly. easy, you know, oh, the gym's hard, you know, you deserve a, an ice cream bowl. Uh, oh, you, you're exactly. stressed. You deserve. And it's like, I don't understand why people, I understand why people are like, fall for this kind of trap but i i think maybe with time enough people are talking about self-improvement and the the dangers of obesity and the dangers of being sedentary and the just like the importance of continuously <clears throat> exercising your brain to like you know not have alzheimer's when you're old like all these different things it's like i hope with well, I don't know exactly who I'm hoping for, but I hope that people are inspired by people like you and me and people that have inspired us. I hope that more and more people can start to level up their lives because I just, I find it to be kind of disappointing where you walk into a mire and 60% of the people seem fat, sad, depressed. And it's like, man, this is hard. And it leads to me to a question that I have for you, which is like, do you sure. have a, do you have a circle of brothers that like you, that kind of keep you moving or do you have like are you a leader of that or like do you have people in your yeah your close circle i'm curious yeah that's a great question and you know i find this question to be so interesting because i'm not sure if it's because i grew up in new york city or like it just my experiences but i'm someone who I, i've gone to different places in my life and i've hung out with various different people like i'll be honest with you i love the vibe of this podcast like when i was 13 14 uh, if a few more decisions had gone wrong in my life, I could have easily ended up in a gang in New York City and Queens. Honestly, if, if a few more things in my life had gone wrong, mm -hmm. I've hung out with people like that. I've hung out with people where in high school we were all low-income first-generation students trying to get to college and trying to make it. I've hung out with people where I've hung, I'm have i in college and then you see someone spend $300 a night on alcohol and that's unfathomable money. Like For you and your parents, it takes a minute to get $300 and then for these people, they're just casually bragging about it. So I've hung out with various different spaces and i think arguably so it's developed my intuition or my intuitive ability because when you see again when you grow up out of your neighborhood and you start to see the world for different places you start to see the transactionalism you start to see how people value different things you start to see how for instance if you grew up in the bay area of california the expectation is hey by the time you're a sophomore you should have an internship that pays you at least three dollars an hour versus if you grew up in a poor neighborhood in queens or the bronx it's like by 25, your parents have told you all your life, you're lucky if you're going to do Uber Eats or internships. You start to see these correlations with just mindset, with the way people think and move. But I think irregardless, one point stands true is that you really are who your friends your friends are. And I find that when I'm in a circle with my brothers who are religious, like I'm a practicing Muslim, I become a lot more religious. Even if I did nothing in that moment, just to see the brothers talk about God or really be god conscious it just raises your level to a certain degree or even being with you right like we're talking about entrepreneurship we're talking about creativity like i'm natural like it's 10 o'clock at night no one wants to talk people want to watch netflix man like we're talking about like creative stuff we're talking about like our struggles out here and I, my energy is still as high as before i think honestly you know at this point in my life being a young adult i still do have different groups of circles that fulfill different purposes but i i'm glad that i've had that ability because it's shown me 
that things can be so different. And there's actually this French proverb, I can't say in French, but the more things change, the more they stay the same. So even if these things are different, like for instance, that one friend in the Bay Area who was making $20 an hour or someone who's doing Uber Eats for five, you still see the similar gist of nature that in sense that irregardless of who you choose to hang out with at the end of the day, they will bring out that same nature that they're in. So if you're staying with a friend who's doing Uber Eats all the time, you're going to become the next Uber Eats driver. And I'm saying this as someone who did Uber Eats less than a year ago. If you hang out with people who are striving for their MPH program, you'll also hang. You'll also become the next MPH. And I'm also saying this as someone who just got their MPH offer. So being in these different areas, I think I'm very blessed and fortunate to have seen multiple different perspectives and entertained each different lifestyle enough that I kind of know who I want at this point. And I can generally do that without kind of having this fascination i think a lot of us for self-improvement when we do self-improvement we first do it just so we can be the popular person or we can be the person who has friends and be well respected but then once you enter that space you're like wait this wasn't really the answer it's kind of just encouraging some other type of degenerate behavior so i want to be more spiritual i want to be more in tune with my soul or i want to be more god conscious etc so i think to really answer your question i don't necessarily have a group that i stick with 24 7. i am someone who is a little bit more multifaceted and i know it's not the common conventional advice but the benefit I find by having these different groups is that I get to peer into this life a little bit. I get to peer into that life a little bit. I'm like, okay, I'll take the best of both worlds and make it my own, I guess. And I'm, I'd love to put that question back to you. Yeah, it's really well said. Yeah, I think I'm like I've had some good friends, like a, like two or three from like childhood that I've kind of stuck with, but I happen to live with one, so I guess I'm kind of lucky. But, you know, the other ones I see occasionally. But I think an interesting thing about life is that throughout life, as you go up these levels and as you keep networking, you're just going to – your circles are just going to become better and better. Like in some sense, as you're on the upward path, you kind of attract others that are going up. Like when you see someone that's exactly. going down or stagnant, you're like, Ugh, I'm, re- I'm repelling, eh, not my strat. But I totally see the side of like, well, I'm going to look into their life just a slight amount just so I can see what not to do because that's actually a really, really, really good lesson. <laughs> I don't want to do this. It is. And, you know, but <laughs> yeah, so I'm a person who ever since the podcast, I've met so many different people and I bet I could reach out to a lot of them and ask for advice or ask for whatever. And, you know, I have lots of connections and but i have the core few connections but i think with time maybe i'll find other core connections and yeah i think yeah it's true it's like you are who you are surrounded with and if you're not with anyone who's motivating you you really have to be self-motivated which is pretty hard it's nice to have someone rooting for you so exactly this way what environment you're in and then they you, you find it's kind of like back to french proverb again you will find that ever goes if we hang out with they will bring out what they are. So that's just something you could be in France. You could be in like Australia. It, that's not going to change. Like who you hang out with is really going to just bring out that side for better or for worse. So yeah, exactly. And I really like what you said about how self-improvement, it shouldn't be your entire identity because sometimes I find this with, you know, a lot, anyone can become like unidimensional or single axiom to where it's like, you know, you know exactly what they're going to talk about as soon as you're like coming up to them and you're kind of like, well, this kind of got boring quickly. They really haven't, they haven't really tested the water. Sure. They might be good at one dimension, but it's like anything else. And they're like clueless. And I see some people like who are just gym bros who only care about the gym, but it's like, you try to have a convo and it's like, oh, there's not much convo going on there. So it's like, I'm a huge fan of becoming pretty well-rounded in a lot of ways. And I think self-improvement is that it's like the you know how is your relationship with your family how is your relationship with god how is your relationship with your future goals are you able to you know are you able to be competent in the world in not just one dimension like you know if you're going to be a father one day you have to be competent in the leading dimension the humility dimension the providing for the family dimension the communication exactly. dimension with your wife all these different things that you have to be really really you know practiced at and my goal is to be very very competent in a lot of those different things and sure that's all in line of self improvement but i can totally talk about other topics too if needed like it's not it's not like someone's going to get so bored of me well maybe they would but yeah i like the idea of just having a lot of different you know competencies 
Of course, and I think, you know, Harley, one thing I realize as I get older, too, it's like, sometimes it's not even, like, self-improvement is the answer in the sense of ideology. So, again, everyone has their own specific ideology. Some people are like, look, I subscribe to the Netflix ideology. At the end of the day, I want to watch six hours of Netflix, I mean, mindless, but that mindless activity could also be self-replicated with self-improvement. You could just sit on your YouTube screen, watch other self-improvement content creators for six hours, and be, like, sit in the same mindless zone so yes you maybe you're in a slightly elevated platform now because you're actually engaged in information that can be a bit useful but it could still exacerbate the one dimensionalness or like that single axiom that you mentioned and i think the answer to that is that people as you said they have to be multifaceted they have to be critical thinkers and they also have to really discern what is unique to them what makes harley unique what makes you unique is that you have three separate youtube channels and you're equally into all of them that is unique that's not something you see the average self-improvement youtuber do so it's clear and it's representative that Harley, yes, took some elements of self-improvement, but still made it his own. And if you're not able to do that, it just shows you're indoctrinated in a different way. So that's why they call it counterculture. So even if counterculture is like, hey, look, we resist what the government and traditional society is telling you, great. But you can still fall in that same kind of paradox, that same kind of conundrum where you're still blindly being indoctrinated, still blindly following. You just chose a slightly better pill, a slightly better ideology to just mindlessly follow, which at the end of the day, you're still going to have to turn left or right. You didn't really change that problem. You just went on a slightly better platform, but you still have to choose left or right. So I think, you know, critical thinking, kind of having that intuition of really asking yourself, what is it about you that would make this unique? Be it the gym, be it self-improvement, be it with YouTube, be it with your job. Even Because at the end of the day, like a lot of people say, I hate my job. The job's reason why my life sucks, but maybe it's not actually the job. Maybe it's your perception of the job. Maybe the job for you specifically, it would work really well, but you have such an anti-work culture ingrained in your head that you refuse to see it as a possibility because there's some people that do great at their work and then they have a YouTube channel. And there's some people who are amazing at their jobs, but they're so one-dimensional that they go home and they're like, honey, I can't do anything for the rest of the day. So it's not necessarily just the fault of the job. It's not the fault of YouTube. It could be your approach to it too, but a lot of people will not realize it if they want to take such a singular approach of like, hey, What's my problem? Oh, it must be because of just this and this alone. And I, I'm, I'm guilty of this before, so that's why I can be so confident in saying that we have to be careful of taking a very black and white or one-dimensional co uh, correlation and be like, oh, how do I get out of this matrix? How do I get out of this rut? Must be self-improvement. Must be this. That could help you, but if you approach it in the sense of this holy grail ideology, you just replace one North Star of Netflix with a holy another North Star of watching videos you're not going to even implement for six hours. So, Dang, well said. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I think every single person listening has that uniqueness that you talk about. Like some people say, oh, I'm, there's nothing special about me. I'm just an average Joe. And it's like there's no such thing as an average Joe. Look deep in. Like every single person has that specialness to them. And, you know, sometimes you need others to point that out. Like I hadn't actually thought about that. Most people – you're right. Most people don't have the three channels. and It sounds so strange. I can almost never relate with anyone. So, so what do you do, Harley? Well, I have a few YouTube channels and they, I've already lost them, <laughs> you know, especially if they're old, but that's okay. I, yeah, I'm, I think every single person has the ability to be unique online and inspire others because I think like, you know, with the COVID and with people like missing human connection they open up a video and they see a guy struggling to talk and they see a guy trying his best on the his first few youtube videos it's like this is going to resonate with people i would say like this should be inspiration for anyone listening who hasn't started some kind of journey to start because you know Absolutely. neither of us knew what the heck we were doing when we started but now we have some sense of where we're going and it's been totally worth it yeah, and you know, I'm so glad you brought that up. For anyone who's thinking about start, please, for the love of God, just start. You're going to have a million and one excuses not to start. You're going to be like, my voice sounds like crap. I can't record it. I have an iPad from 10 years ago. Please just start. You are doing yourself a huge disservice not to start. And if honestly, you're still struggling, you're finding resistance, I'm going to share this story with YouTube. Yes. I remember for YouTube for three, four months, I really did not want to do it early. I was in this, what I call productive procrastination stage where productive procrastination is when you do some things where on the surface level it is productive but you're still delaying what you actually need to do so i was sitting at my wallpaper i was thinking about my youtube username but i still wasn't recording the video and i remember like even three four months in i was like okay objectively speaking i have everything ready i have to make the jump now 
but I was still so terrified. I was like, oh my God, what are other people going to think about me? How's my voice going to sound? How am I going to look? But you have to realize this. If it comes to the point where you still find so much resistance, you need to just place yourself on your deathbed. And I know it's going to sound harsh. I know that's not the easy answer, but you need to place yourself on your deathbed and try your best to replicate the feeling of regret. And honestly, you're never going to even be able to do it successfully because no one's going to know how it's like to be on your deathbed moments away from dying regretful until you're actually in that stage and i hope for anyone's watching that we're never in that stage but you need to put yourself in that situation put yourself in a few seconds where you're looking back in your life and be like did i not do that youtube channel because i was just afraid of what a few people were going to say about me did i not start that youtube channel because i was just too scared to explore my own potential did i quit just because someone said something about one of my videos being crap and i just really took it hard are you gonna value that more then you looking back at your life and being like, damn, I could have done something great with this, but I I was too afraid. Because I had that moment at the end of 2019, Harley, and if I had listened to my heart and say, that said that, no, don't do it, I would have missed out on over 400,000 views. I would have missed out on over, making over 500 videos that had different people comment, you changed my life today. Yes. I would have not oh, ever talked to you. I would have never talked to other self improvement If I had listened to that fear, because that fear is a facade. It's a huge facade that looks like it's a monster for your face. But the moment you make that jump, the moment you record that video, the moment you start stock trading, the moment you start going to the gym, you realize it's not that bad. And then it makes you realize, what if I made that other choice? What if I made that other choice to keep spending another five years, 10 years, never recording video? What if 2022, instead of um, embarking on weight loss, he gained another 30 pounds? He still didn't do YouTube for now. Enough. Like imagine a life where I never did YouTube again. It would have been three years since I quit YouTube. What a tragedy that would have been. What a tra That's a tragedy. The, you know, they say um, the grave is filled with what ifs. The almost to be um, Edison's, the almost to be Bill Gates, the almost to be people who had such wonderful ideas, but they were so scared of other people, so terrified of what other people were going to say about them. And they, they took their, their greatness, they took their potential, they took their uniqueness with them to the grave. So honestly, if you're still in this podcast and you're, I'm speaking to you as if it's, you're my 19-year-old self, you need to think about it. The pain of regret versus the pain of being on your deathbed and just realizing you didn't do it. I'm telling you, you're going to have to face one or two pains. You're going to have to face the pain of recording that video, facing so much resistance to it. Or you're going to face the pain of being on your deathbed and being like, wow, I really didn't give myself the chance I could have done. And it's, it's just that simple. And it, again, it's not an easy answer. I didn't like hearing that. It was either this way or that way back when I was like, hmm, but almost four years later, look at where it took me. And this is, this is just the start. This is, I'm nowhere near where I, I need to be. But if, imagine I never started, <laughs> none of this would be possible. Totally. And you have to replace me with you, the viewer. This is you. This could be you mm -hmm. with YouTube, the gym, fitness. It starts today. It doesn't start tomorrow. It doesn't start next week. Everyone wants to wait for, like, as you said, everyone's waiting until they graduate from college because they don't have a job mm. or they're waiting until I have a house, then I'll do it. Or I'll wait until I have a family too. It never comes. Stop waiting for change to come. Nothing changes until you change yourself. And the more you wait for this magical white night to come, the more it'll never come to begin with. Dang. This is motivational. This is amazing. Yeah. It's like, you should let the fear of regret outweigh the fear of failure. Failing is optimistic. When you fail, you learn. Don't be afraid of what other people are going to think. If you think about it deep down and it's like, hmm, how many people are actually thinking about Medi at this current moment? You know, probability wise, exactly. probably zero at this current second. You know, maybe your mom. No, I'm not displaying you, but it's like, Harley, how many people are thinking about you right now? Oh, what are all these people going to think if I talk about porn on my channel? It's like, no one gives a single flying exactly. F because you know no one is talking about Harley right now because they're talking about them. They're living in their own world and their own life. They might see one clip and they're like, oh, that's a clip. But it's like, why are you letting some false idea of what some people are going to think? And it's like, sure, maybe you might have that one person in your life who's like, why are you doing that? But it's like, oh, no, you're going to not pursue all of your dreams and goals because that one person it's like dang you must place a lot of power on that one person and so yeah i'm totally i'm huge on this whole like who cares what other people are gonna think you know 
over time, people are going to start to think about you. It's kind of ironic. In the beginning, you're so worried. Oh, all these people are going to think about this. But it's like, in reality, no one's going to care. No one cares. There's no pressure. No one's going to watch. <laughs> it sounds pessimistic. Exactly. But in this period of not many viewers, you can build your craft. And soon, in five to ten years, you're going to be the cool guy that all the, the self-improvement people listen to. And it's like... Boom. It was worth the few people to give some critiques and it's worth the hate comments every one seventh video. You know, who cares? People that are hating are normally just hurting. And so, yeah, I'm just I really love the energy of this conversation. It it's been it's been so fun. Likewise. And you know, I love the correlation you said because you actually made a fantastic correlation. A lot of people are so self conscious. And I'm someone a couple of years ago I had terrible social anxiety. I used to be so self-conscious and everything. I was like, oh my God, if I look at someone the wrong way, if I say the one wrong word, uh, my life's going to crumble down. But it's, as you said, at the beginning, it's like these two parallels. You're so self-conscious, yet the amount of people who actually care, like, it's zero. People are worried about their own problems, their own mistakes, their own challenges. Stop taking yourself so seriously. Yet, ironically, as you improve your craft and you start going all the way up, that's when people actually will start caring more. But at that point, you're so secure in yourself that it doesn't really matter. Like even, like even for me now, if I get a hate comment, the other day I actually got a comment about something about you sound like Andrew, like you, you're another Andrew Tate wannabe. And I said the difference is he doesn't have hair, but I do. Like I made it as a joke and I genuinely meant it because to me it was funny. Oh, yeah. Versus if it was me a couple of years ago, I would have been like, damn, man, that, that's such an L. But people need to realize two things. In regards if it's your family member, your friend, acquaintance, what people will say about you is more of a reflection of who they are than it is to you. It is never personal. It is never, never personal. I'm thinking from someone who used to take things very personally. People, their actions, their reflections of you, what they're going to say, it's a reflection of who they are. See as if a stranger is going through a journey, makes a pit stop, and then moves forward. And a lot of people, again, when you stop taking yourself so seriously, you realize how light everything can be. You realize, wait. That making that video wasn't so hard after all. Going to the gym and maybe getting one comment about where my body's at right now isn't so bad. Because I know six months from now, I'm going to destroy that other person. Or not even, you don't even have to be that competitive or cutthroat. But the point being is, when you never stop taking yourself so seriously, you can just breathe and be like, look, I'm going to do what I got to do. I'll make my mark in this world. And if they like it, cool. If they don't, well, they weren't going to like it to begin with. These would have been the same people who would be like, Harley, why? Are you putting so much work on YouTube once you have a million subscribers? And these would have been the same people. Holly, why are you not starting YouTube? You could be so much better. People are going to say what they're going to say. You can't control that. So stop worrying about controlling that. Yeah, that really well said. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's yeah, it's fun to find people who are, what's the right word? Obsessed with their craft, fanatic about, you know, the journey, you know, who like there's some people that are just. I think there's two types of people. There's the people that are like willing to take the risks and try. And there's the people that stand on the sidelines skeptical because what if you exactly. fail? But it's like, it's fun to find people who are like, well, I'm going to fail 70 times along the way. And it's going to be a great learning lesson. And it's just going to be a self-improvement pill. And oh no. And I'm going to get better at rejection, at facing rejection. I'm going to get better at adapting when things don't go my way. And so, yeah, man. I'm curious. Oh, like, no, yeah, exactly. Like, what would be? I guess we've kind of gone over this a lot, but like, yeah, we've. Normally, my question to people is like, "What would you do? What would you ask? What would you say to your younger self?" But I guess, let's switch the question. And what do you think the person on the bet your deathbed is saying about you right now? Wow, that's a good question, man. What the person that does that say about me? You know, that's such an interesting question because, you know, if, if we both hopefully live long lives, we do so much more. Like, what we've experienced the last three, four years is nothing compared to what we have to do for the next couple of decades. So that's a really good question. But I think, again, I think in the end of the day, as I said about human nature, despite how things change, there's still some basic gist. And I think, I think one thing he would say is that if you do the hard things in life, your life will be easy. But if you do the easy things in life, your life will be hard. Because I've just seen this be too recurring in too many instances. And it's just, the more I've talked to people, the more I've seen the shortcuts again. I'm thinking, I'm thinking this as somebody who used to take so many shortcuts in my own life. You just find things that are ironically harder. But the more you're just wanting to be like, look, 
I know recording that video is gonna be hard. I know going to the gym is gonna be hard. I know doing this, I know doing that's gonna be hard, but you just do it anyways. Your life somehow just becomes more manageable, more tolerable. You can do it. And you're like, wow, I guess it wasn't that bad after all. So again, I mean, in reality, I actually don't know how to answer that question. I think that's one of the things that I've carried with me over the years and I, I highly doubt it's gonna change. Now, I'd also like to know what your answer is. <laughs> yeah, it's that's really well said. It's I just hope, you know, I hope that, I don't hope, I think I know that at least at this point, Harley of 95 can look back and say, well, he definitely was not afraid to try and he definitely tried his best and he was truly a genuine person who was, well, humble, but also was kind of helpful, humble and helpful. It's like, I have a lot to say, but I don't try to say it as if I'm super smart. I want to say it because I want it to resonate with people. And, you know, I just, I want to keep being the guy that people can come to for hard questions, the guy that people can come to for advice. And I just want to be, yeah, I just want to be that guy who acts somewhat like Jesus did in some ways. Like, I'm just kind of a huge fan of the, the humble teacher vibe, which is what, kind of what Jesus embodied. So, you know, my goal each day is how can I become more and more like Jesus in my actions? And maybe throughout my life, I will keep learning how to do that more. But yeah, it's, it's honestly almost an unfair question for me to ask us, but I, it's a great motivator and it's just going to keep propelling me to a better version of me. So, yeah. Of course, man.